I would like to welcome the moderator, Fausto Rodriguez. Are you there, Fausto? Hello, there you are. I see you. Muy buenas tardes. Gusto estar con ustedes. Good afternoon. All right. Well, I'm going to leave this panel in the capable hands of Fausto and let him introduce himself and then his panelists. And I will see you all back in about an hour. Thank you, Regina, for, for you know, this opportunity. Um, I am I am Fausto Rodriguez, uh, I am the director of the Cult of Latin America and the director of the COCO program for this region as well. And I am the privilege to have to moderate this part of the standing and passionate people for chocolate and cocoa. Uh, I would leave uh, everybody to introduce, introduce by the, the self. Uh, Please, uh, we can start with Emily. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Gracias, Fausto. Gracias a Jenny, a todos. Eh, eh, voy a seguir en inglés, pero quisiera eh, dar el, el, mis primeras palabras en español. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for um, inviting uh, me to this event, and I'm really glad to be here. Um, thank you, Jenny, for organizing. Uh, my name is Emily Stone. I am the co-founder and CEO of Uncommon Cacao. Um, we are a group of four companies that work across the specialty cacao uh, industry. Um, we started in Belize in 2010. Um, I uh, started the organization Maya Mountain Cacao, which works with around um, 400 uh, cacao producers in the regions of Toledo and Stan Creek District uh, in Southern Belize, um, running centralized fermentation and drying operations. Um, and then in 2014, we started a second uh, export operation in Central America called uh, Cacao Verapaz, which works um, across multiple regions of Guatemala, um, running also centralized uh, fermentation operations in collaboration with um, associations, community-based associations. Um, we also have an office in the US where we operate as Uncommon Cacao. Um, we store cacao in warehouses on the east and west coast of the US. And um, through our office in the US, we um, supply cacao to uh, over 200 uh, bean to bar craft specialty chocolate makers, uh, depending on how you want to call them, uh, around, around the world. Um, and we recently opened uh, an office in uh, Europe as well. So we store cacao in Amsterdam. And uh, we've been very focused on transparent trade and radically transparent um, business since we started. So I'm looking forward to this discussion and, and um, your questions. Thanks again. Thank you so much, uh, Monica. Thank you, Fausto. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here. I'm thrilled to be part of this panel discussion and this summit. My name is Monica Rogan. I am a co-founder and chocolate maker at Goodnow Farms Chocolate. My husband and I started our single origin chocolate making company many years ago uh, because we wanted to focus on the fine flavor, fine flavors that different farmers in different regions had to offer. So we buy uh, fine flavor cacao directly from farmers. Um, we work with them directly and we bring it up to our farm in Massachusetts where we built a chocolate factory behind our, our home. We make our chocolate there. We're small batch, single origin chocolate makers highlighting the unique flavors of the cacao. We really love working with farmers directly because um, it helps us understand what goes into making chocolate and it helps us, um, you know, when we understand it, we can really share it with the customers and teach them about um, where chocolate comes from, why it's important, all the things in the value chain. Um, I have the privilege of work with people on this panel in our traceability and transparency project through FCIA. Uh, if you were part of the previous discussion, you heard some of those panelists discussing how we're really committed to defining that and creating a common language for the whole industry to utilize um, and how that's really important for us to move forward. So we just want to make fine flavor, great tasting chocolate and teach people about what goes into it along the way.
Thank you. Uh, Simran? Sure, thank you, first, Sarah, and um, thank you to Jenny uh, and the organizers for giving us the opportunity to share a little bit about our story um, and the work that we have been part of on the Transparency and Traceability Initiative that's spearheaded by Kate, uh, as well as sort of how it impacts all aspects of our business. Um, I realize that I think my background looks to be like a mirror image. I'm not sure if it looks like a mirror image to all of you, but uh, if it if it does, I think you can get the gist of it. It's the same as everyone else's besides my name. Um, so I am Simran Bindra. I'm one of the co-founders of a company called Koa Kamili, based here in central Tanzania. We work with a network of about 4,500 smallholder farmers. Um, we buy their uh, wet cocoa and run it through a central fermentary, uh, similar to what Emily does in um, my mountain in Belize. Um, we've been at it since 2013 and are proud to be supplying um, some of the world's best chocolate makers all over the world and paying the highest prices in the country and the region for cocoa. Um, my business partner and I come from backgrounds in international development. And so we knew that any business we wanted to start, um, farmer impact was going to be key. And we knew that our intended customer base was going to be uh, the kind of customers that also valued this. Um, and so from the beginning, um, from the onset of our business, we built into all of our management systems, our uh, lot management inventory, et cetera, um, a complete um, set of transparency and, uh, and traceability um, criteria so that we're able to um, provide full um, traceability back to individual farms or any container that we ship. Um, you know, any container that we ship, we can supply names of each and every farmer that contributed to it, how many kilos they they sent in, how much they were paid, um, et cetera. And so that's just been a really um, core part of our business. We're proud to see our segment of the industry really care a lot about it. Um, and I think we've got a long way still to, to continue to share share this story um, and mm -hmm. uh, convince sort of broader Coco on uh, the impact that this kind of work can have. Um, and I'm proud to be working with Kate, Monica and Emily on the uh, FCIA work spearheaded by Kate. So, yeah. Thank you, Sintran. Okay. Hi. Um... Thank you so much, Fausto, Simran, Emily, Monica. It's great um, to see you all. I am uh, up in a second here. Um, go um, from a, a lot of wonderful countries and producing countries, and um, we are. Uh, I'm also the uh, chair of the Value Chain Committee, working alongside um, my fellow panelists in trying to better explain and understand how traceability and transparency are a very important part of our business, um, but then even beyond that and including that responsibility. So I'm excited to be here to, to speak and, and to share with, with all of you. Thanks a lot, uh, Kate, for your nice introduction. Thanks, everybody, uh, for participating in this panel. Um, in the two prior panel, panels, um, the, the words traceability and transparency has been put in And I wonder why. Why is it important that? So, we would start for the beginning, and maybe Kay, you can help us on that. Uh, what is exactly traceability and transparency? It's a software, it's a system, it's a concept, it's an approach. What is transparency and traceability? Um, thanks, Fausto. That's a that's a great question, and over a lot of 2021, uh, the members that are here on the panel spent many weeks having conversations about specifically what is it and why is it important. And really what we came, um, what we came up with um, is, is traceability is um, 
the physical journey of the bean and transparency or, or traceability is that map of the movement and transparency is sort of the interest and the ability to share that with others. Um, and the FCIA through our work has really focused on um, trying to acknowledge all of the um, all of the actors in the supply in the value chain and um, recognize what exactly those words are, um, which is why in addition to talking about traceability and transparency, we're also talking about um, defining defining terms and having a better definition. I'm happy to jump in okay. here um, as well. Um, it's actually, it was interesting to read in the glossary that um, Uncommon Cacao is referenced specifically as having a little bit of a further definition of transparency. And so I'm happy to share that um, as well. I see our report was just mentioned in the comments. Um, so, you know, I think as, as Kate mentioned, FCIA's um, value chain committee has been in the work on the glossary is looking at traceability as the map and then transparency as the willingness to share the map. I think um, from our perspective, you know, there is the physical traceability is just one factor that goes into transparency. And so for our purposes as Uncommon, we've, we've defined transparent trade as a specific you know, sort of way to go deeper on the topic of transparency. And we define transparent trade as verifiable published pricing for every transaction related to a cacao purchase along the value chain, um, including information about who produced the cacao and where. So um, I think we're, we've sort of come out with that definition, which indicates the importance of financial transparency alongside physical transparency. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that more. Fausto, you you were asking about about this. What is it? Is it a system? Is it a is it a, a map? What is it? And I think that um, in agreement with everything Kate and Emily have said, we're looking at the world of chocolate as an ecosystem. This is something we talked a lot about in our value chain committee meetings um, when we were discussing traceability and transparency and why it's important because you know, the world of chocolate, it's so interrelated, but there's definitely all these different actors that, you know, have parts to play in this ecosystem. Um, so it's, it's, um, and in, in an ecosystem, there's feedback, you know, like it's not just a direct line. There's a lot of connections and it's, you know, cyclical and, and it's, it's interesting and it's complex. So, you know, what we're hoping to do with transparency and traceability or traceability and transparency is um, really provide clarity and be able to connect and communicate with others and do it in a way that is easily understandable so that we can all be on the same page and um, have shared experiences. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sindram. Could you please add uh, about um, why it's necessary to have a traceability and transparency system? Where does this need come from? Um, sorry, Fasi, you broke up a little bit on my connection over there. I think, uh, do you mind repeating the question? Okay, I, I wonder uh, if you can add about uh, why it's so important traceability and transparency. And where does, uh, where does this demand come from? Sure, um, I think it comes from sort of two things. One was, it's just, it's core to how we ever wanted to run our business was uh, through a system that we knew would capture all of these these different data points um we knew that the work that we wanted to be doing was one that would ensure um full traceability back to farms both for you know any future certifications and also just for um to be able to stand by you know our claims that we we, we knew we wanted to be producing cocoa in an ethical fashion and we knew we wanted to be able to um have the data to to stand by whatever claims that we made. And so we really baked that into our systems from day one. 
Um, I do think it's a little bit, it is challenging in that where there is no sort of unified um, metrics around what we in the industry want to be measuring and capturing. Um, and I think that that does make the system tricky. You know, like we're able to say, we know every farm that contributes this data, uh, contributes to this shipment, we know how much we're all paid. Um, but then if a customer comes to us and asks, oh, well, I wanna know how much more a farmer sold made by selling to you versus someone else, or how many women farmers contributed to this shipment, we're able to do all of that. Um, but I think people don't really necessarily understand the amount of time that um, pulling all the data out from the various places um, to put that uh, in a cohesive sort of snapshot for a customer is. Um, and I think that that's something that we as an industry should work towards sort of standardizing. It's also very easy for people to say, oh, well, I paid this amount to this to these farmers from here. And you're like, yeah, okay, but did you pay dried cocoa? Did you buy wet cocoa? What exchange rate did you use when you were changing those numbers around? Like you make a small change in your percentage of wet to dry conversion, a small change in using a seasoned average exchange rate versus the exchange rate at the time of reporting. And suddenly your percentages can look a hell of a lot better, a hell of a lot worse um, for whatever you're trying to compare. So I think that we as an industry should focus on how we can sort of standardize some of this stuff so that we can make reporting um, easier for um, origins like myself and for uh, chocolate makers to be able to tell their customers as well. Um, I don't think we're there yet, um, but I'm, I, I'm pleased to see that there is a lot of work uh, and a lot of appetite for getting there. Yeah. Um, and if I can add something to Simran's comment, uh, part of the... Part of the chocolate, great, thank you. Part of the chocolate ecosystem assessment that we are developing is asking questions along that value chain so that we're not only asking farmers and farmer groups what they're doing and not recognizing everyone else along that you know environment that is contributing and that, um, what Monica spoke about in terms of feedback and exchange, all of that is important to fostering, I think, a better, a healthier environment for cocoa and for chocolate. Um, so I think that's definitely um, thinking beyond just the information that you gather from farmers. And if you have that all the way through to your chocolate is an important, I think, next step that I'm really happy to be working with this incredible group to to try and figure out um but i think that's an important part to to consider so, one thing so, also thank can you I Kelly. Uh, monica can do you want to add something i'd love to add something fausto thank you um another another point to bring up you asked why is traceability and why is transparency important um, from a food safety perspective, you need to ensure safety. Um, you know, we also have to, as a chocolate maker, where I rely on the highest quality ingredients to make my chocolate bars, my single origin bars, where I usually, I use just the cacao beans and sugar. I, I don't hide behind any additives or, or, or um, flavors. Um, I, I really rely on the highest quality beans and I need to know I need to ensure that I'm continuing to get the same beans from the same farmers within the same geographic region on a consistent basis and understand the processes that they're taking to make sure that I get that same high quality product. And if there's any variation along the way, I need to have communication with them to know what's going on so that I can adjust my processes to account for that when I make my product. So there's a communication that needs to happen or else I can't make what I need to make for my consumers. And then if you think even bigger picture, you know, chocolate, chocolate is a, a, a newer thing, uh, you know, you. it was, it wasn't made until about maybe, you know, over 100 years ago, but the definition of chocolate 100 years ago is very different than the definition of chocolate today. Chocolate has evolved. And as chocolate evolves, so does the definition that goes into explaining what it is to consumers and to the public. So we are in the process of updating the definition um, as is demanded by the consumers for wanting to know what they're eating. Thank you so much. Uh, it's clear, but I would like to also 
to know uh, about uh, farmer because Kay had already mentioned why why the, the, do the farmer to be engaged in this transparency and, and traceability system? What is it for them? Emily? I'm happy to, definitely, yeah, I'm happy to take that. Thank you, Fausto. Um, I think, so from our perspective, um, there, there are a number of reasons why transparency is so absolutely important when we talk about um, working collaboratively to really create a totally new system for trading cacao, which is the decommoditization of cacao moving away from traditional trading of cocoa and the traditional pricing structures of commodity trading of cocoa. Um, for a long time, the chocolate industry had looked at sustainability and improving farmer livelihoods as um, basically best done through investing in projects and certification premiums that are paid to farmers um, in pretty small amounts, um, but essentially are charity projects. And through that route, ignoring the business practices of the value chain, focusing just on these projects, there was an opportunity to quote unquote, have an impact with producers and in producer communities. Um, these were very often pretty top-down and short-term approaches of limited time projects. And it's no wonder that the data shows that the impact of these projects on producer livelihoods over time has not been that substantial. Um, you know, as recently as um, several years ago, the World Bank put out a report showing that over 80% of cacao producers around the world uh, are still living at under $3 a day. So this is unacceptable. And it's clear that the business practice of trading cacao itself is what has to change. And so Uncommon Cacao and others in the space have started looking at really looking at how to reshape pricing and drive more value and higher prices uh, to producers. And the best way to do that is through a transparent decommoditized system. So having transparency in the value chain helps to create accountability for all actors within the value chain around pricing and margins. It helps chocolate makers advocate for the higher prices of their chocolate bars um, that they're charging to consumers and thus enables them to have a more sustainable flow of business so they can continue to charge higher prices for chocolate bars and continue to pay producers higher prices. Um, transparency also helps to reshape the playing field and gives producers power through access to information around pricing, around um, how their cacao is, is sort of flowing downstream in the value chain, that in a traditional commodity system or even in a traditional certification system um, typically is not offered to producers. So, you know, we see the role of transparency truly as a systems change platform that enables these conversations to happen in, as the my fellow panelists have been talking about this, you know, clear, um, uh, and and Thank easily you, communicable language that we're all we're all sh uh, speaking the same language. We can all look at the same numbers, and we can hold ourselves accountable around the prices um, that are truly Thank being you. paid in the specialty cacao value chain. We will be back on that. We will be back on that. But now that we all understand about the, this concept and, and the need of transparency and traceability. I, I would like to ask you to share concrete cases on traceability and transparency systems. Who you want to, to, to start syndrome? Um, sure. I think I've I think I've touched on that a little bit. You know, we record and digitize every purchase that we make from a farmer. And you know, at our busiest time of the season, we're making 200 transactions a day. Um, you know, 190 of those are for less than five dollars. Um, each of those transactions get entered into a system where our farmer, the farmer registration number, name, gender, etc., is all recorded, um, and then that purchase is assigned to a certain lot for fermentation, and then that lot is assigned a number, and then that number follows the shipment all the way through to the customer. Um, and so we're able to say for each lot that we send, we know each and every um, farmer that that sold to us and, and how much they were paid. We also um, we also for our organic farmers, of which 1,300 of our 
4,500R, uh, we do physical sort of on-farm verifications where we map we map all their farms using you know um, basic Android phones where we um, go through farmer surveys and we uh, map the polygon of the the farm area. So we know um, not only do we know the name of the farmer who delivers it to us, uh, the cocoa to us, we know the the actual um, geolocation of each each and every one of those thirteen hundred um, farms. But you know that's that's all well and good, but I think it's interesting to sort of touch on, and there was a question from a, um, a, a Teresa Grant in the chat about how we can ensure that the work that we are all putting into transparency and traceability isn't co-opted by sort of big cocoa. And we see that time and time and again, you know, um, we'll see like a, a big multinational cocoa buyer was buying certified organic cocoa from Tanzania at one point. And when I spoke to the certifier, I said, look, we're mapping each one of our 1300 farmers. There's no way that these guys are mapping each an individual farm. They said, you oh, know, they just draw a circle around the country and say that that's the farm. You know, okay, for an average consumer, they don't understand the difference between the work that happens uh, that we do and then the work that happens or doesn't happen when a, a super large commodity trader draws a circle around Tanzania and says that that's the farm. So I think we as a sector within the industry have to, think really hard on how we can avoid sort of co-opting of our, our work by sort of big chocolate. And we, we've seen, we've all seen it. Um, and sort of how do we differentiate? How do we work on consumer education? I think we've talked about this over the last 10 years that I've been in the industry about the biggest hurdle to our segments of the market's growth is consumer education, consumer education, consumer education. Sort of how do, how do we get better at that? I, I don't know, I asked my fellow panelists. Okay. Okay. Since Sinran, before before going to Emily, uh, Sinran, do you do you do you want to share something about challenge or such a factor of your system? Or such a challenges factor? in the challenges in the traceability systems. In, in your yeah, system, I mean, it's, yeah, in implementing your system, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard work. Um, <laughs> we have to go visit 1300 farms and map the polygons of them. Um, and uh, to be honest, first of our biggest challenge uh, has always been infrastructure for us. Um, you know, our first couple of years, we didn't have um, cell phone network. Even now, when we're trying to do um, all of our data collection, it's a lot of trying to find the farmers at the right times on the right farms, trying to um, ensure that we have enough connectivity to be able to uh, run our system on the cloud and you know, experimenting with satellite internet or uh, signal boosters or switching between five different networks and then um, doing political situations when we have complete um, shutdowns of cellular systems. So yeah, so infrastructure is a, a huge challenge for us. Um, it's getting better though. It is getting better. You know, 10 years ago, I used to have to drive to the cell phone tower to send an email and now we have uh, pseudo functional Wi-Fi at our facility. So, you know, things are improving. Okay, for sure. Yeah, uh, Emily, could you uh -huh, could you continue? Sure. Um, should I continue about challenges and implementation? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so we've we've done a lot. I met had a, a many different experiments and um, tried many different approaches around sort of living transparent trade. And I wholeheartedly agree with Simran, it's really challenging. It's also really expensive. Um, and yet one of the main reasons that we do it is because 90% of our customers, uh, the chocolate makers that we work with, have told us in surveys that this is the number one reason that they work with us or in the top two reasons that they work with us. So over 90% of the chocolate makers feel that this level of transparency is, is critically important. So we keep doing it despite the challenges. Um, we've been publishing transparency reports since 2012. Um, our first one was covering our 2011 harvest season at Maya Mountain. Um, these have evolved quite a bit over the years as we've identified challenges, tried to resolve them and then evolved. Um, but they've always incorporated this focus on financial transparency and transparent trade, um, along with stories and data about um, the producers themselves who are, who are um, producing cacao. Um, I think some of the challenges that I'll point to first. Um, 
similar software hardware challenges with implementing data collection in the field. Um, in 2018, we worked with a um, supply chain software program called Supply Shift, um, which was generally a great program, but we were trying to use it for, I think, the wrong reason. We were trying to collect cost of production data on a weekly basis. Um, every time we were buying, we would ask producers how much time they had spent on their farm um, that week um, in an attempt to collect data that would enable us to generate deeper um, cost of production and, and eventually farmer uh, profitability data, since that is, I think, really the goal of a lot of this is ensuring producers are, are profitable at the end of the day from dealing in the cocoa business. Um, and it was really challenging because, um, you know, the phones that we were using were getting all sticky, um, covered in baba. You know, it was our buying team who was doing this data collection. Um, the uh, internet challenges, like Simran mentioned, switching across networks, trying to figure out how to get signal, um, the data being lost. And then actually one of the most challenging parts was cultural. Um, producers really loved the opportunity to speak with our team at okay, the buying point you. and hear Monica, do you want them. to share with us your experience? Sure, I'd love to share. Um, so I think that it's interesting. I love hearing the way that people are talking away about their businesses and how they focus on transparency and traceability. For us as a small batch chocolate maker, it's a little bit different. Um, we work directly with seven different origins. And what that means is that we have direct relationships. We've either gone to origin, we've seen how they farm, we've spoken with them, we've confirmed that our visions are the same regarding um, paying a premium for the value that's added in the production of the cacao, ensuring safe working conditions, um, ensuring environmentally sustainable practices, um, but I have to explain, this is not a one size fits all scenario. You know, I work with some single origin, single states, and I work with, um, some co-ops. I work with some organizations that there's 10 farmers providing cacao, in, you know, fermenting it in a centralized location or 20 farmers or 50 farmers. So it's really hard because there's, it's different definition for each situation. For us as a chocolate maker, it's really important to be able to know where the cacao is coming from and to confirm that it's gonna be the high quality that we need to make our great tasting product. Because if our product doesn't taste great, no one's gonna buy our chocolate. So we have challenges along the way. Um, and actually uh, one of the biggest challenges we have with you know, traceability is resources. As everyone said, it takes a lot of effort and time and work to really document this and convey it. Um, but it is important. Um, something that we've been working on for several years, we just never published was, you know, we love the transparency report that Uncommon does. It's fantastic. I, I We tried doing one, we actually did it and I still haven't released it two and a half years later because life got in the way. So we're a small business and everyone is trying to do their best, but that's why it's so important to have this common language and to have common standards where we say, hey, these are the most important things. Let's agree that this is what we believe and let's all work towards like giving, you know, giving what data we're, you know, how we feel about these points. And let's, let's guide this conversation for that consumer education. Because if I'm doing all this consumer education on my own and everyone's doing it in their own way, like, it gets to the consumer in a confusing kind of way. Let's work together and harness our energy so that we can all, you know, chip away little by little and really reach the consumer and explain what's going on. So, I mean, that's, those are some challenges we have with our, our, our transparency um, and traceability. Thank you. Um, and Kate, about latitude, could you share your experience and also uh, your as assessment about costs and benefits of implementing this system. Um, I, I think the amazing thing is that what Emily has spoken and Simran have spoken about in terms of cost of implementing is true. And as Cacao Latitudes, we are um, in May uh, still working on our transparency and impact report for 2021, and we are hoping to get it out 
as soon as possible, but in terms of life getting in the way and so much information and what information and how to express it. I think that's one of the, one of the really impressive aspects of the Uncommon Report that they have focused on price transparency. They have tried to make it very clear to everyone across origins and have a consistent message and, and, and conversation. And that's absolutely why I think it's an important, it's, a, it's an important component to reference when we look at the definition of that traceability and, and having that somewhere um, visibly. In, um, in our experience, uh, the, the implementation is much easier when we work with a partner like Simran um, because he's doing so much work with farmers. And it's something mm -hmm. that I think often, you know, in this, in this um, group of people, um, the chocolate makers want to be maybe close to the farmers. And there is someone in that country that is working and, and connecting with those farmers that we also need to recognize the work and effort that they're putting in. In Emily's case in, in Guatemala and in Belize, that's directly through their organizations, but you know, in other locations, um, it's through partners. And uh, Cacao Latitudes is the same situation where we work with partners in some countries. And in some countries, we work directly through our e-com operations. Um, like in Ecuador, um, where I used to be based. So it's definitely something that when you're in the country trying to collect the information, um, it's the realities of working in and moving around in difficult locations. So I think the cost and the time um, and the energy to collect information that then you're not entirely sure going back to Simran's point, what are you supposed to communicate about? Um, and if it's something that people are constantly coming back to you um, for more information. Um, so I hope that we can provide some help um, in, in sort of getting some standards out there. Thank you, Kate. Uh, before closing this section, uh, I would like to go back to Emily for two things. Uh, one concrete is there is an interest uh, that you can explain about uh, difference in culture that you have faced, and also your vision about costs and benefits of implementing traceability and transparency system. Sure, definitely. Um, thank you. So I'll just go back quickly to the comment I was making on some of the cultural uh, challenges. Um, in there's, you know, I think for many of us in this value chain, we realize that we're part of a bigger system. Um, you know, we all have our sort of role to play. We're a cacao producer, a cacao buyer, a cacao fermenter, an exporter, an importer, a chocolate maker, a distributor, a retailer. And yet I think our most powerful moments come when we're feeling connected to each other. And I think that is one of the most important parts of transparency. But in this particular case, the challenge was when we were collecting the transparency data, um, it felt to cacao producers like we were just like hammering them with questions every time we came to buy cacao. And they really missed that opportunity for them to lead the conversation with us. And, ask us questions like what's going on with the market today? What's going on with exports? And so it was a great, I think, learning experience for us of how to make sure that these conversations really are two ways that we're not just the ones asking the questions, but that we're also collecting questions, collecting um, you know, challenges and then sharing all of that information um, back with producers and sort of across that full system as much as possible. Um, but it, I would say at every single stage of our transparency process, there are Challenges, we are also in the process of our 2021 transparency report publication now. And, you know, we, it's, there is so much data and, and not only data, but verification of the data um, that has to be done. And then analysis and, um, you know, sort of putting it all into a, a consumable format is really challenging, mm -hmm. um, but it is, it is really worth it. Um, this year, we're working with the FCCI, the Fine Cacao and Chocolate Institute on our transparency report data collection and verification, um, which has been a phenomenal process. And our hope is that this will help to 
address some of the um, challenges around sort of lack of standardization um, over, over the medium and long term. Um, in terms of uh, sort of cost benefit and how to make this really worth it for different folks across the value chain, again, I think for producers, really looking at these reports, like they're publicly available, they're online. Um, it takes, you know, we recognize that it takes a lot of effort on the producer side and on the exporter side to share this information. But then there is also a lot to be learned and then leverage that you can identify and use um, in your conversations with buyers as a result of these reports. That is definitely a, a key purpose of these reports um, is again, to help to change the playing field um, for producers. And um, for chocolate makers, uh, we started offering a few years ago um, QR codes. I have a couple of them right Emily, here. Uh, and I Hold on one second. I'm not telling you. One sec. One sec. This is, I don't know. Actually, I don't know if you see it, but you can put them on your packaging and it's a great way to um, show it directly to consumers as well. Thank you, Fausto. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry for, for being so, so quick, but uh, we are almost ending. And I would like to put uh, Anna a, a question because it's important to understand uh, how this kind of system could uh, uh, function, could function for the whole sector. Do you think that it's possible to have a traceability and transparency system for the whole sector or at country level? And in such case, how could it function and how we could ensure its sustainability? This is an open question and you can answer. Just, just uh, go ahead. It's interesting. I see there's a comment about um, it's unfortunate that there's no African perspective on transparency and traceability on this platform. And I think answering this question is a perfect example of why that voice could be so important. Um, because what comes to my mind is the situation of Ghana. Um, Ghana has a very strong, um, tightly controlled system. Um, that has done really incredible uh, work on traceability uh, and transparency. It's in fact, one of the only countries in the world where Farmgate price is, is published. Um, and I think the governments of Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire with the implementation of the living income differential um, over the recent years has also shown the impact that having this kind of sort of traceability and transparency on more of a sector level, um, what kind of an impact that can create more systemically across a, an industry in a country um, or in a region. I think that um, I think that our hope for our fine chocolate industry, our chocolate industry or craft chocolate, or whatever industry, it's chocolate. Our hope is that we're able to communicate better, and our hope is to raise the level of um, of of everything of of what the farmers are are getting for the cacao that they make, uh, raise the level of understanding of consumers for the chocolate that they're eating, um, you know, enhance the lives of everyone along the value chain. That's what the summit's all about, right? So I think that you asked, is there is there something that, that anyone can put into place? I think that, yes, there are standards that an organization can put into place. And I think that, yes, people can say, yes, I agree with these standards and these are the standards that we're abiding by. And I think that once standards are established, I think that it's nice because if they're written down, it's common language, common understanding, and people can say, hey, I choose to participate in that or I choose not to. And then others will come to the table that maybe didn't have the opportunity or didn't understand before. And I think it can only make things better. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Sinran and Kay, do you want to add something more? No? Okay, so let's go to the, the question from our audience. So there is a question for Kay. Can anyone talk about mass balance sourcing and how it limits transparency and traceability? As a consumer, how can I know when this practice is in place? Sure, um, I'm happy to, to explain a little bit about mass balance. Um, and I think that this is part of the reason I am committed to defining 
um, traceability and transparency as that um, kind of physical movement, because I think it's a defining characteristic of the craft and, and fine chocolate. Um, mass balance is what is used in Rainforest Alliance and fair trade cocoa to essentially the, the cocoa purchased from origin or from farmers. Um, those farmers go through certification processes and then that cocoa is purchased from an aggregator uh, in country and then sold um, for processing. And along the chain, that cocoa can be physically used in the process of making the chocolate, which would be that physical transparency um, or that physical traceability, sorry. Um, but mass balance allows you to buy um, Oots or Rainforest now, credit or buy Oots cocoa and use other cocoa to make your chocolate. So it allows for not physical traceability to happen in the supply chain, but for you to still be supporting kind of the initiatives on the ground. And I think that this is um, something for processing facilities at a large scale who are trying to create blends and work in a very different chocolate industry to the one that we're talking about today um, are trying to use as a way to connect um, origin and uh, I think responsible sourcing. And that's, I would say, their fight. Um, and But I believe that okay. there's something you, that's- Kate. Uh, sure. You, I'm uh, just I'll... just one more question because we are almost ending the panel for for Monica. Um, how is cacao important for a small producer? How much production do you get from this work? Sure. Um, it was kind of hard to hear. I think you asked what, how is cacao important for a small producer, and, and is what is my production annually? Is that what you asked? It's, it's important. Oh, how is it important? Okay. So it's it's different. For for every ah. um, origin we work with, it's different. Um, for our farmer in, in Mexico, I work with him directly and I import the cacao and I truck it up from Mexico. Um, for um, our farmers in Guatemala, we actually work with Uncommon Cacao and it's transported on the, the ship, the the big freight trip, freight, freight trip ship, and um, it arrives at port. We bring it to our farm. Um, sometimes, with smaller producers, we'll air freight it in. That's obviously more costly, and I don't like to do that. But sometimes I'm limited because I'm a small maker, and I really want to get this cacao, and I will air freight it. But you know, it's different for every scenario. One thing I do want to ask is I'd love for Kate just to finish what she was saying about mass balance and her take, because I just wanted to hear the ending of it. It was really important. Uh, one of the biggest differentiators about craft and fine is this physical traceability and physical connection. And I think that what needs to happen in the industry is um, coming together and trying to work together. And as someone who works for a larger company that is managing the commodity space, it's my, my goal to move more traceable products that are sustainable and, and coming from producers and getting to chocolate makers. So I don't think that it's an us against them I think it is trying to grow this market and trying to communicate with consumers in, in a clear way. And, and this is one of those, in my opinion, low hanging fruits. Learn about mass balance, learn about what makes you different. And it's eye opening that there are so many people who don't understand that the fair trade bar you can buy in this grocery store doesn't necessarily contain fair trade cocoa beans. And if you think about that, and uh, you know, I can understand why there's so much confusion in the market. So let's start there. 
And let's make sure that we know what those what, what those traceability practices it's are. It's very important. It's very important concept. Thank you for, for sharing. I would like to ask to finish uh, to Sintram and Emily to share uh, their takeaway for this panel with, to close our conversation. Sure. I actually think we have about 25 minutes more. So I'm actually going to ask Kate to finish finish what she was saying. Yes, actually, I'm going to interject real quick. Um, you do have 25 minutes more. This panel goes until 2.55. And yes, everyone, you can please finish your statements, what you're saying. Okay. Um, we want to hear from all of you. And you do have more time. You have until 2.55 PM. OK. Oh. Um, sure. Teresa, I promise you I'm not trying to confuse you. Um, I. I think that mass balance is a response to large industrial processing. And um, it's something that is, you know, if you look at a lot of countries and you look at the, the movement of certified cocoa in the general market, um, I can understand why it's misleading because uh, it, it's been a mass movement towards okay, if, it, if I have my cocoa certified, then it means it's sustainable. And um, it's unfortunately part of the reason why the group of people here couldn't have a meeting last year and after an hour come to a definition of traceability and transparency. And we couldn't come to a definition of sustainability because it's so encompassing in different aspects of what we do, um, which is why all of us, um, myself included, I'm trying to continue to educate myself about what's going on in the market and how to be a more responsible player. Um, and that, um, mass balance is something that I think is a very strong characteristic of the commercial commodity industry and is a very diff definite line between what craft chocolate and fine chocolate is not necessarily prom is not promoting. Um, because we have reciprocity, interaction, um, feedback, exchange with the um, with the people within our, our value chain. Um, Clay Gordon has a, a, a very um, a dynamic, uh, colorful explanation of, um, of that mix. It is, it's trying to recognize that when you're, you're working in the commodity space and you are building blends from different origins or you're doing a uh, a single origin bar where you need hundreds of tons and it's coming from different farmer groups or different locations, you're, you're buying that at different times. A lot of that is um, trying to address the, the, the market, but unfortunately I think misses a bit of the spirit behind the connectivity in the supply chain, which is part of the reason that, um, that Cacao Latitudes exists to push that amount of commercial connection along the supply chain. Does that if answer? <laughs> Reach out, say no, uh, or ask more questions to, if it doesn't make sense. To, to play devil's advocate a little bit and sort of further muddy the waters. Um, you know, I, I understand everyone's concerns around, you know, mass balance is literally removing some aspects of, of uh, transparency. Um, but is it a good thing or a bad thing was one of the questions, I think, from um, Teresa Grant. Um, and yeah, I mean, when you say, well, they just mud it's just allowing people to pass off cocoa that is not necessarily fair trade certified as fair trade certified. Yeah, but it also has allowed us to sell our cocoa into a chocolate maker that was a, a much bigger factory and was uh, their whole factory was fair trade certified. And they understand that what we do goes above and beyond fair trade and that we are doing right and they wanted to support the work that we do. Um, but because we didn't have the ability to pay for fair trade certification and don't necessarily agree with the structure of it, um, it allowed us to be able to, to sell to that chocolate maker. So I, yeah, I mean, uh, shades of gray. Yeah, let's say black it's, or white, let, there are shades of gray, yeah, I guess. Let's say it's not, it's, 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 it's not the worst, but it's not 
what we should necessarily be striving for. But Simran, that's a great example. Yeah, but I think that it's not not the best, not the worst, not what we should be striving for is a, probably a pretty good way to sum it up. But in that in that sense, uh, who who could support uh, in in order to um, to ensure that transparency and traceability is is really is really in implementation? Who who be a third party to ensure that? And to to to, uh, to deliver, confirm to to clients who could, who could be the actor that is necessary to uh, I mean to to validate your transparency and traceability system. I mean, I think I it really. Spoke, but... Go ahead, Zimmer. Yeah. I think it really it really depends. Um, you know, without question, validation and verification is important. Having some form of of third party verification, you know, helps to add trust. Um, but it is also adds cost, and so that's been one of the main challenges with certifications. Is it's a very expensive system to create trust, and as we just heard about with mass balance that you know, once people start to peel back the layers of what the certifications actually means, that trust in the certifications itself erodes. Um, and so these certifications can be extremely expensive for producers to um, implement, um, for them to not only sort of implement the first time, but then be recertified every year. Um, and what's ironic is often the cacao that is certified doesn't necessarily sell at the highest price. Um, it can actually be uncertified cacao that's produced more either through post-harvest processing methods or through, um, you know, different ways of looking at quality or connection or transparency or um, relationships uh, with the market, you know, gets a higher price, even though it's not certified and so it doesn't have that, that stamp. Um, and so I think a lot of this in the end, as it does with so many things, as we heard on the last panel as well, come down to you know, what are consumers willing to pay for? What are companies willing to pay for? Um, you know, it's, it is connected to all of us. I will say that there are new regulations um, coming through in Europe and potentially in the US um, that will create more of a systemization and, and set of guidelines around traceability, in particular, less around transparency. And so I think we'll see things start to shift in terms of what is expected. Um, and, and then I think there will be more guidance around the third party verification that's required around traceability, but we're not, we're not there yet. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. Actually, Emily said it's ironic that uh, the certified cocoa isn't necessarily the cocoa that's selling at the highest price. It's also ironic that, you know, I think there was a um, series of articles in I think the Washington Post last year, which, you know, said that there was more issues in the investigation of forced child labor on rainforest and oot certified farms and not. So I think that's a little ironic as well when you're talking about a social set of standards. Um, and first, so you ask like which, which third party, what's the system? I think what it comes down to is, you know, work with people that you trust um, and sure easier said than done sometimes. But um, I think that's a really important thing that we have to have to focus on. I think it shouldn't be lost. Everything in this conversation is saying what are consumers willing to pay for? Um, and they'll pay for things if they feel it's important. How are they going to feel it's important if we can communicate it? And it's about consumer education. Like all of this is about consumer education. Like we need to be able to effectively communicate with our audience why it is important. That's, a, that's why we're all doing this. That's why we're working together. And that's why, um, that's why we've been trying to define this because we're trying to have that connection. So I think that we're in the process. I think that we're on our way. And I think that things are going to develop as we, you know, as we journey. Um, but I, I do feel that we are we are on the way. And um, in, in that in that line, in the same the same discussion, because somebody 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 sent a message in, in the chat and sent about certification levels. I, I wonder if uh, if the market 
can uh, can reward to a farmer for um, feeding the system or sharing the information. How can we how can we convince them to be engaged in traceability and transparency system? What would be your recommendation to them? I'm sorry, I didn't totally understand the question about how to involve um, producers in the transparency. Sorry, Fausto, do you mind repeating? Yeah, no, no. it's because we are, we are not yet, uh, and Monica say right now that, uh, that uh, the consumers, uh, and we are not yet, uh, we have to educate yet to consumers. So the market is not ready to reward all the effort regarding transparency and traceability. So my question is, how can we engage to, to farmers? Because they have to, to give information or even to feed the system, how to, to engage them? What would be the message to them in order to convince them to participate in this traceability and, and transparency system? So for, for producers, but for the purpose of consumer education? I guess I can comment specifically on um, how to incorporate producers in the uh, transparency data collection uh, that we do. I actually think the key is not at the producer level, it's at the aggregator level. And so it's really about ensuring um, record keeping, like integrity of records, digitization of records, however possible, and um, really clear uh, information sharing with across the sort of set of partners. Um, for most producers, at least in our um, example as, as Uncommon Cacao, they're going through their regular, um, you know, buying or sorry, selling of cacao um, to, to the aggregator, whether that's Maya Mountain or Pisa in Haiti or uh, Corte de Paz in the Tumaca region in Colombia. Um, and then it's really sort of the burden essentially is on the aggregator or Cocoa Camille, for example, in Simran's case, um, you know, to, to be managing the transparency data. I think the example I shared earlier of when we were trying to work directly with producers and sort of implement that into the, the weekly buying system, we did run into to issues. Um, but we're about to do another another round of that this year around cost of production um, data. And we're looking at different types of incentives that we can use for that. So hopefully by, by next year, I will have some more information to share on um, ways to you know, incentivize and ensure um, you know, fair, fair playing field and participation for all actors in the um, value chain on transparency. I'm, I'm not sure, I'm gonna jump in because I'm not sure if, I'm not sure if I'm hearing this correctly. I do feel that consumers, that some consumers recognize the value in traceability and transparency. And I do feel that they are paying for this added value because people are buying my chocolate. <laughs> you know, people are buying other people's chocolate that where they believe in, you know, traceability and transparency, they see that added value and they also enjoy the flavor and the taste. What I'm saying is that, you know, and I might be wrong in this, but I believe the fine chocolate industry has about 5% of the total chocolate market. I believe that was what I've recently heard. That's 5%. And just imagine if you grow the education of consumers about why traceability and why transparency is important, what you could grow in the market so that more, more farmers could be rewarded for the efforts that they are taking in this. So I think that if we want to engage more farmers, we need to get more consumers. So that's why this communication is so important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. It's important, the communication and also the way how the, the reward that consumers uh, do to, for, for the price, Etc. is also transferred to, to all the to all the actors along the value chain, and in the case of the farmer, 
because if you want to have a reliable information in your system, you need to convince partners and all other actors in the, the disability and privacy system. So this is why I, I asked about, about that. And, and, and also thinking in thinking also again in the, the global or a national or trying to scale traceability and transparency system. The said that it's possible, but in this case, how we can ensure it, its sustainability? How can we fund a national traceability and transparency system? I'm not sure. Are you asking how we can fund an international traceability and transparency system? Was that the question, Fausto? Okay. Um, I might be biased because it's, I'm it's part national of it. It's a national system, a national level. A national level, okay. So I think that it needs to be an international initiative. And because there are so many players that are involved all over the globe. And I might be biased because I am part of the Fine Chocolate Industry Association and, and we're actively working on this with people that are committed to it. Um, but we're actively trying to define terms and set standards. Eventually, this is a multi-step process um, and it will take a long time, but we are in the process of, of defining terms. And then, you know, perhaps that organization will create standards or perhaps an outgrowth, perhaps an outgrowth of creating this common language will be another organization that's committed to setting standards. I'm not sure. I don't think it's a national level because I think that we need to be aware that there are so many stakeholders at different parts of the process that are all around the world. I think it needs to be a coming together of, of everyone. And I think it's yet to be realized, but I think that um, I think that, as I said before, we're in the process. I'd love to hear what everyone else thinks. Mm -hmm. Monica, sure, I'd I'd be happy to add in in terms of building an, a national system and and moving off of what Monica said. My focus would be on growing the demand for the products that Monica is, I want Monica to grow and I want all of the Monicas to grow. And I want people to recognize not only the amazing quality that they produce, but the amazing beans that they've purchased that go into them and, and the work that is done at the farm level. And this is something that through spending about uh, 13 years living in the Dominican Republic, Mexico, and Ecuador, and working with farmers, you see and you understand. And in the past two years, I've now switched to um, learning about chocolate making and having more of an opportunity to understand that side. So I think it's really um, growing, growing that demand and sharing that story, which is why um, Spencer and Cocoa Runners and, and a lot of different um, avenues for communication are so important. The Cacao and Chocolate Summit is also one of them. We need, we need more people buying that chocolate and then asking Emily um, for beans and buying more from the farmers and being able to build that out in what I would consider to be a, a, a healthy way. Um, trying to, to create a, a national system is, is like we've said, gonna, maybe going to be costly and, um, and not necessarily get you the best results. So that would be my, my best recommendation um, for how to grow. Thank you. Senator and Emily, do you want to add more? Um, I'm happy to, uh, I mentioned the uh, Ghana example quickly um, previously, just as I think that's really the only national system that I'm really aware of. And um, while it has led to some really positive outcomes, I think there are also challenges within that system. So I think, you know, as Kate mentioned, having a national system on traceability 
and transparency is one way to do it, but would probably be extremely expensive. And, you know, when you look at the, where the money needs to go in the cacao value chain, I think, you know, there is, there is enough that can be done on transparency and traceability by private actors within the value chain, um, enabling, you know, governments and other broader systemic actors to, um, you know, focus on creating a better enabling environment for cacao producers to really succeed in the business of cacao producing. And those um, factors will change depending on each country, on each region, on each community. So um, yeah, I, I think, um, I think there's a lot that that the private sector is already doing, and it's it's just critical to um, make sure there's verification in place, and that the onus is never on the producer themselves to be footing the bill for the trans transparency and traceability efforts. Okay, thank you. Now. Now, yes, we have one minute for our final message, a key takeaway. So, could you start, Kate? I hope everyone um, is interested in continuing a discussion about traceability, transparency, and also defining some of these terms that we use in the industry. And if anybody out there who's watching is interested, um, I, we're more than, than um, happy to involve more people in the conversation, um, people who agree with and disagree. Um, this isn't trying to tell everyone what something is, it's trying to create some common language for everyone to work with and to work through um, because creating that common language is gonna, is really what's gonna grow um, or what I hope will grow this, um, you know, this part of, of craft and, and fine chocolate. So thank you, Fausto. Thank you to um, everyone at the summit. Gracias. Monica? I look forward to seeing where this goes. I mean, I, I, I look forward to continuing to get my great quality beans from farmers and make delicious fine flavored chocolate and share it with consumers and grow the market. And, and I look forward to continuing the conversation like Kate said. Thank you. Thank you, Sindra. I think my sort of key takeaways are that we as an industry amongst sort of the this niche part of the industry that we're in need to work on how to be more cohesive on our messaging around transparency and traceability. And that as with everything with our industry, uh, we need to focus, focus, focus on consumer education to differentiate us from um, the broader market. And I look forward to continuing to work on achieving those goals. Um, and thank you to uh, Fausto, my fellow panelists, and everyone who attended, and especially to the people who are organizing this for all of us. Um, yeah, this has been wonderful. Thank you, Sintra. Emily. Yeah, thank you so much to, to Jenny and to Jody, to everyone at the summit. Thank you, Fausto. Um, thank you to my fellow panelists, and, and thanks to Kate for your hard work um, at FCIA on the Value Chain Committee um, driving this conversation. It is so important. I think um, my key takeaways are, um, are number one, I, I think, yes, we need to be cohesive. And yet I also think this dialogue is really important and that, you know, cohesion um, should always be dynamic and not static. So I hope that as we continue this work on the glossary um, and as an industry, we will always be learning and evolving. Um, I think that's gonna be really important. Um, and I also uh, look forward to as some of the, um, some of our, the participants are saying to, there being more producers in these conversations in the future as well to share their experience, um, you know, participating in some of these transparency and traceability efforts, um, because I think their voices will be the most valuable in understanding what will have the most impact and what will be the most feasible as we look at scaling up 
the work on transparency and traceability for more systemic change in the future. So thank you so much to the really active participant comment section today. Um, it was wonderful to, to hear from you all and, and thank you again to everyone for your time. Thank you, Emily, and thank you to all of you for this privilege to moderate this panel. Thank you for your minimal, meaningful experience and opinions. And let, let's keep talking about transparency and traceability. Thank you, Regina, and thank you to all organizers of this panel and this uh, cacao and chocolate meeting. Yes, thank you, Fausto. And um, thank you also, Emily and Simran and Monica and Kate. Um, there is just so much to be said on this topic. As you, as you said, it could be um, a three-day summit on its own, just talking about traceability and transparency. So I appreciate the effort you made to get as much in as you could. And it is a discussion that certainly does not end with this panel. I hope that we all continue to discuss this amongst ourselves, with our customers, um, with our distributors, um, with government and NGOs, because it's an incredibly important topic. Um, well, that is the last panel for today. Um, I wanna thank everybody who participated. I really wanna thank our audience as well. It's been wonderful to see all of the conversations going on amongst yourselves, um, asking questions and you know, sharing information with each other. And that's one of the most important things about this summit is just to bring together as many people we, as we can to participate in these important conversations. We'll never be able to talk talk about everything in an hour and 15 minutes, but we'll be back year after year. And in between, we'll be talking about all of this on our social media. So I hope you follow us um, at Cacao and Chocolate Summit. And I hope you sign up for our newsletter so we can keep you informed. Tomorrow, we have another great day ahead. We're opening up with a very important discussion. It is going to be on cacao and the climate crisis. And once again, we could do a whole three days, if not three months, on cacao and the climate crisis. But we are going to do our best to at least hit some key points in an hour and 15 minutes tomorrow morning. That panel will kick off at 11 a.m. Of course, the summit kicks off at 10.30 a.m. with live traditional music from Kausasho, and they're a wonderful band. If you missed them this morning, you might want to tune in tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. and listen to 15 minutes of beautiful traditional live music. It's a great way to start your day. And um, then the next panel, we panel number one is Cacao and the Climate Crisis. Number two, starting at 12.20, and these are all Eastern times, is Building Resilience in the Fine Cacao market but the mark the producers perspective so tomorrow we have a lineup of producers from all over the world who will be joining us at 12 20 to talk about building resilience and it will specifically be their perspective the producer side and then wrapping up at 140 our final panel from 140 to 255 will be a deep dive look at the heirloom cacao projects report heirloom cacao is a very important a topic all around the world where people are trying to keep that tradition and these heirloom seeds and heirloom cacao trees and distinguish them, you know, from different hybrids. So that will be tomorrow from 140 to 255. I want to thank um, all of our sponsors, um, Conexion Chocolate, Grocer's Daughters Chocolate, Mocha, the Fine Chocolate Industry Association, Cacao Latitudes, uh, food activist and Traduec. Um, we hope you will look them all up and support our sponsors because they're the ones who make this possible. All right, and with that, um, we can all go eat some fine chocolate and enjoy the rest of our afternoon. And we will see you here tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. Eastern time. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.